right guys, this last video is all about colligative properties, which are how they're the properties of water that change when you dissolve something in water. So when, when you put something in water and make a solution, the properties of the solution are going to be different than the properties of the water when it was by itself, which kind of makes sense, right? And, and those properties depend on the number of dissolved particles that are in the water. So the more particles you dissolve, the more the properties are going to change. Okay. So, so first let's look at, um, at some solutions. So in these diagrams, I have all solutions with a molarity of one, right? So same concentration. But if you look at how the solutions are different, um, in my first beaker, I've dissolved sugar. In my second beaker, I've dissolved sodium chloride. And in my third, I've dissolved calcium hydroxide. So in all of these scenarios, the properties are going to change. They're not going to have the same properties that the water had because I dissolved stuff in it. But if you look at the differences between them, um, notice that when I put in sugar, that one sugar molecule stays one sugar molecule. So even though it dissolved, it stayed one piece. Where when you dissolve something ionic in water, um, it breaks apart into pieces. So the first thing you want to look at um, is, is your solute molecular? Does it have covalent bonding in it? I'm going to write covalent versus and molecular here. Or is my solute ionic? I know that these are ionic because they start with a metal and end with a nonmetal. I know sugar is covalent because it has only nonmetals in it. So the way they dissolve in water is different. Ionic things break up into more pieces where covalent things stay one piece. And that's going to come into play later on. So... What happens to the boiling point of water when I dissolve something in water? It's going to make the boiling point increase. So water typically boils at 100. Now I might have to heat the water to 105 in order to make it boil. I made it harder for it to boil. Why does this happen? So think about it. In order to boil, the water molecules need to separate. We need to turn from liquid to gas. If I now put something in the water, the water is going to be attracted to that solute, right? And you can see, like, especially with the ionic stuff, guys, there's positive and negative particles now floating around in my water. And I know from, from the past that water, I'm going to just draw it again for you, water has a positive end and a negative end. So my water molecules are going to be attracted to my salt particles and they're going to have a harder time separating, right? So um, let's say water is attracted to my solute. So it makes it harder to separate to turn into a gas. Okay, so um, when you guys are like cooking, right, and you add salt to your water, um, it actually, it's going to take longer than for the water to start boiling because it has to heat up to over 100 degrees Celsius to get going. But then once, once you're boiling your pasta, the temperature of the water is actually going to be hotter. So it might cook your pasta a little bit faster. Um, what does it do to the freezing point? When you add something to water, um, it's actually going to make it harder to freeze also, so our freezing point is going to get lower. So typically, water is going to freeze at zero degrees Celsius. If you add salt to water, now it's going to have to get even colder in order for it to freeze. It's going to have to go down into the negative numbers in order to be cold enough to freeze, which is why um, adding salt to the roads in the wintertime helps stop the um the the liquid water on the road from freezing which is good because we don't want we don't want ice so um if we think about what freezing looks like we're taking liquid water and it has to get close together in order to turn into a solid right so what the particles do the salt particles is they block the water from getting close together so the particles block 
water from solidifying. It makes it harder for the water to do that, okay? Um, so the more particles you have, the more the boiling point and freezing point will be affected. So let's take a look at some questions. Which solution has the lowest freezing point and the highest boiling point? If I look at these three solutions, right, they're all going to have a freezing point lower than zero. They're all going to have a boiling point higher than 100. But which one's going to be the most is my CaOH2. And if I think about why, it's because it breaks up into the most pieces. It has the most dissolved particles. Something else they could make you look at, guys, um, in this case, I gave you all of the same molarity. But if they gave you different molarities, that would want to be some that would be something you want to look at too, because a higher molarity means more particles dissolved as well. If they all have the same molarities, then you want to look at, okay, which of these things can break up? Um, of your two ionic choices, calcium hydroxide breaks up into the most ions. So that's going to be your best answer. Um, which solutions will be able to conduct electricity? So guys, we we talked about this back in our bonding unit. You can only conduct electricity if you have moving charged particles, okay? So so my, my sugar solution is not even going to be a choice. Even though sugar dissolves in water, it doesn't break up into ions. We don't have charged particles moving around, so we can't pick from that. Um, of my two ionic solutions, both of them will be able to conduct because both of them have um, mobile ions. So we need the movement and we need the charged particles. Um, if these substances were just solid, if we did not dissolve them in water, they would not conduct on their own. And again, we talked about that in detail in our bonding unit. Um, ionic things conduct when dissolved in water because they have motion. Um, if they ask you guys of these two, which one will be able to conduct more electricity? What do you think you'd pick? Hopefully you're thinking, well, if I have more ions, then I'm going to be able to carry electricity better. So it's the same idea with like which one affects the freezing and boiling point the most, um, which one's going to conduct more electricity. You always want the thing with more um, more particles. Okay. Alrighty. Um, okay, guys. Something else that is affected by dissolved particles is vapor pressure. So if we think back to our vapor pressure, um, liquid turning turning into gas. Um, when it when it evaporates, the more particles you're making, the more gas particles you're making, the more the vapor pressure is going to be. Um, when you dissolve something in water, the vapor pressure is always lowered. Because when you dissolve something in water, the water is attracted to those dissolved particles, making it harder for it to turn into a gas. And if you're making less gas, you're going to have a lower vapor pressure, okay? So um, there's actually a formula right here. And this formula is going to help us calculate what the new vapor pressure of the solution is when you dissolve something in it. It's going to show us the change um, from when we had water. So let's look at an example. I have 40 grams of NaCl dissolved in 100 grams of a solution at 23 degrees Celsius. Um, and we want to know what the vapor pressure is going to be of the solution compared to the vapor pressure of H2O by itself. Okay, so let's rewrite our formula. The vapor pressure of the solution 
equals the mole fraction of the solvent. So guys, um, the solvent here is water. So I want the moles of water on top over the moles of the whole solution. So that's my moles of water plus my moles of, in this case, it's NaCl is my solute. All right, and I want to multiply that by the um, vapor pressure of the solvent, which in this example is water. All right, guys, so um, if I have the grams of water and I have the grams of NaCl, I can figure out the moles of each of those things. So let's start with, um, let's start with water first, moles of H2O. If I have 500 grams of H2O and I know one mole weighs 18 grams, I know that from the periodic table, one oxygen and two hydrogens weigh 18, um, then I can divide and know that I have 27.8 moles of water. Okay, um, as far as NaCl goes, same thing. If I have 40 grams of NaCl, and I know that one mole weighs 58 grams, I know that from looking on the periodic table as well, and I divide, I have 0.7 moles of NaCl, okay? So if I plug that in now, guys, I put 27.8 on the top, and I have to add these moles together to get a bottom number. So I'm going to do 27.8 plus 0.7. That's my mole fraction. Um, and I want to multiply this by 21.5 torr. And I'm going to get 21 torr. So notice that my vapor pressure got lower. It was 21.5. Now that I added salt to it, it's only 21 torr. Um, the reason why they gave us the temperature here, guys, um, the vapor pressure of water is dependent on the temperature. If I had a higher temperature, my vapor pressure would be higher. If I have a lower temperature, my vapor pressure would be lower. But, um, but this is something they have to give you unless they give you a, a graph to look at. Okay, so vapor pressure gets lower, and we can actually calculate how much lower it gets. Um, before, we were talking about how the freezing point gets lower and the boiling point gets higher. This is another thing that you guys can actually calculate, um, and these are the formulas um, that are given to you. So um, I, what I stands for is your number of dissolved particles um, K is a constant so if you need to calculate your new boiling point when you add something to water the number that you'll plug in for K is 0.52 and the units are degrees Celsius per molal because little m stands for molality. That's the unit for molality, okay? So um, when you multiply all of these numbers together, you're getting delta T, you're getting the change in the boiling point, and you'd want to add this number to 100 degrees Celsius, which is your original boiling point of water. Okay, if you're asked to calculate the new freezing point, again, I is your number of dissolved particles, M is your molality, the K, the constant, is going to be different if you're calculating freezing point um, depression, how much lower it's going to get. So your constant is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. Okay, and guys, when you multiply those three numbers together and you get your change, your freezing point is always going to be lower than the freezing point of low, of uh, water. So you want to subtract this number from zero degrees Celsius. 
which is your freezing point of water. Okay, so let's take a look at, at two examples. What is the boiling point, that's important, of a solution that has 85 grams of potassium phosphate dissolved in 200 grams of water? Okay, so um, first, thing, first thing I wanna do here, um, in my boiling point formula, I is the number of dissolved particles. So I want to think about um, when K3PO4 dissolves in water, how many ions does it break up into because it's ionic. I'm going to get three potassium ions and I'm going to get one phosphate ion. So how many ions total do I have? I have four. So four is gonna be the number that I wanna plug in for I. Um, the next thing I have is a constant, so I don't need to do anything there. Um, the last thing that I need to figure out is the molality. Molality is moles of solute over kilograms of water. So they're telling me that I have 200 grams of water here, and I wanna change that into kilograms. So 0.2 kilograms is what I'm going to want to plug in on the bottom. For moles of solute, I need to change my grams into moles. So if you guys look up on the periodic table, I need the molar mass of this giant compound. So I have three potassiums. I have a phosphate, which weighs 31. I'm sorry, the phosphorus weighs 31. And I have four oxygens, which weighs 64. So if I get the mass of this whole thing, it's actually 212 grams per mole. So if I take 85 grams of this stuff, and I know one mole of it weighs 212 grams, I get uh, 0.4. Oops, guys, I messed up. Why didn't you say something? Canceling out crazy units. Um, one mole is gonna go on the top and my 212 grams goes on the bottom. And if I divide, I'm gonna get 0.4 moles of solute. So that's what's gonna go on the top. 0.4 moles equals um, two. All right, so let's plug all of this into my formula. If I wanna know what my new boiling point is gonna be, I need to do I, which is four, my constant, which is 0.52, because this is boiling, and my molality is two. And I'm gonna get 4.16 degrees Celsius. So my boiling point of water is usually 100. It's going to change by 4.16 degrees Celsius. My new boiling point is 104.16 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, how about you guys give the freezing point a try? I'll rewrite the formula for you. You need to do number of dissolved particles times the constant which is 1.86 for freezing. Remember that our two constants are different numbers. And molality. Okay, you give that a try. All right, so guys, this, this kind of is an intimidating picture, um, but if you just kind of look at it, um, this is gonna help you understand what vapor pressure is. Um, solvent alone means you just have H2O in here. Look at all of the gas particles that are created, right? That creates your pressure, okay? See how high we've pushed our level of mercury because our vapor pressure, um, we're making a lot of gas there. When you dissolve something in water, when you have water plus something else, we have a lot less gas. And if we have less gas, we're not pushing on our mercury as much 
So our difference in height is going to be a lot smaller than it is here. So this is just showing you a picture of, of that as far as a manometer goes. This crazy looking picture is our um, phase change diagram. So guys, it's just showing you that typically freezing would happen here and now it happens here. So we've made our freezing point lower. Normally boiling would happen here at STP and now it's happening here. So our boiling point got higher. That's all these crazy pictures are showing you. Okay, osmosis. So osmotic pressure, um, this is another thing that we can calculate, guys, when we make a solution. Um, so this formula, this little symbol here is osmotic pressure. And we can calculate it by taking the molarity of the solution times R, the gas constant, times the temperature in Kelvin. So this formula was just derived from the PV equals NRT formula in the gas unit. Okay, so um, you can actually calculate pressure using this formula if they give you molarity, or we can still use the PV NRT formula depending on what you're given. So we know that we can get pressure by doing that. Or if they give us mass, we can get pressure from doing mass divided by molar mass, which is moles, RT times V. Okay, so, so just like the gas unit, guys, we have like three different ways to write this out, but it's all the same formula depending on what they're giving us. So osmosis is when um, it's when you have like solutions with two different concentrations and you put them together. Um, water is always going to move from when they, from where there's a low amount of solute to where there's a high amount of solute. So it's always going to move in the direction to try to dilute the higher concentration. Okay, so let's take a look at what we're given in this question over here. So we have two students made a solution containing 10 grams of protein in a one liter solution. Okay, um, they're telling us that the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius and the osmotic pressure is 9.25 millimeters of mercury and they want to know the gram formula mass or the molar mass of the protein. So guys, if I'm looking at my three formulas to choose from here, if I want molar mass, I'm going to want to use the formula that has molar mass in it, right? So that's what I'm going to use. In this case, they gave us They gave us the pressure. We're not solving for the osmotic pressure. Um, can I use millimeters of mercury in this formula? No, I cannot. So I have to convert to ATMs. And I know my conversion factor is one ATM is 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so if you divide those two numbers, you're going to get... 0 0.12, 0 0.012 as your ATMs, right? Um, let's see, I have the mass is 10 grams that was given to me in the question. I know R is my constant, 0 0.0821. Um, temperature has to be in Kelvin, so I'm going to take 25 and add 273 to it, and I get 298 Kelvin. All right, and my molar mass of my protein, I don't know because I don't know what the formula of the protein is. And my volume is one liter. Okay, so I want to just cross multiply and divide and solve for X. And when I do that, I'm going to get 0.012 X equals. All right, let me just get my calculator out. You guys should have your out too. 10 times 0.0821 times 
298 and I get 244.7 just going to round it to that divide by point oh one two 